In the last series, we looked at how to develop the moon, how to go from nothing to something, from this to this, and we put a heavy emphasis on profitability so that humanity's presence in the heavens is built on rock-solid market demand, not reliant on whimsical political forces or ideological aspirations. Now we're going to look at what's next, what comes after, what possibilities the moon opens up for us once we've established a presence there. And in doing so, we'll journey from the end of the beginning of lunar development to the deployment of the first orbital infrastructure, the creation of an Earth lunar transfer vehicle, the construction of a mass driver, the establishment of a domestic lunar shipbuilding industry, and the assembly of giant stations in orbit around the moon. But first, let's start at the beginning with a simple question. When you envision the future of humanity, how many people do you imagine living and working on the moon? A hundred? A thousand? Ten thousand? Ten million? I guess that depends on which stage of lunar development you're envisioning. Early stage small lunar outposts or fully fledged lunar cities? How many years pass between those stages? Decades? Centuries? Millennia? What if I told you that the progression from small lunar outposts to fully fledged cities might happen much quicker than anyone realizes. That the demand for massive expansion is there, but that the largest constraint to lunar economic development will be launch frequency over anything else. Let me explain. Lunar regolith is full of iron, especially the regolith located in the relatively flat mare regions, where we'd want to establish a lunar economy for many of the same reasons we like to build cities on flat areas here on Earth. Not to mention, it makes landing a whole lot easier. And it turns out that we can turn this regolith into steel and oxygen gas by smelting it with chromium anode electrolysis reactors and adding a dash of carbon and other alloys. With steel, you can make panels and beams, and panels and beams and 5-axis CNC machines make lunar dreams. With panels and beams, you can build big breathable boxes, also known as buildings and you can fund the construction of these big breathable boxes using other people's money. Government grants if you're well connected, but if not, you can get private venture funding because you'll make a return on their investment, a profit by selling tickets to stay in those big steel boxes you'll construct because they are located somewhere people will pay to stay. The moon. At least that's what you'll tell your investors. But you know deep down that, in reality, the real ROI won't come from just tourism, but rather from the much deeper pockets of Uncle Sam and friends. Since you understand that as soon as the first prototype base is completed and shown to be reliable, a flood of bids will come in for non-tourism related facilities. The demand for lunar real estate will become massive. See, you're kind of smart sometimes, and you know that like the iPhone before, nobody knows they need a lunar facility because nobody has a lunar facility. But as soon as lunar construction becomes a reality, the focus on tourism will fall quickly, as neither NASA, nor ESA, nor DARPA, nor the DOE, nor the DOD, nor the NRO, or the NGIA, or the NIAID, or the Space Force, or Oracle, or Microsoft, or Google, or Pfizer, or Amazon are going to be outbid by a bunch of tourists. And so a global bidding race will begin for everything from massive telescopes for NASA, to a research lab for Johns Hopkins, to a seed bank for Nordgen, to an AI training data center for Oracle. As a massive line forms between the wealthiest wannabe tourists and the institutions and corporations with much deeper pockets outbidding each other and everyone else for the limited resources and time it takes to build a building on the moon. But you know none of it will matter because as soon as Russia and China land the first joint survey rover, the President of the United States will enact the power of the purchaser to procure a federal joint strategic lunar facility, strictly for peaceful scientific research, of course. You can do a lot with steel panels and beams and 5-axis CNC machines, yet no matter how advanced your domestic lunar production capacity becomes, no matter how much you make off-world, this roaring economic engine will always need inputs from Earth or elsewhere 
for anything that cannot be easily sourced on the moon. Nitrogen, nitrogen derivatives, humans, and hydrogen, including all the H2O and hydrocarbons humans like to ingest, such as food and microplastics, you know, basically anything that isn't iron or silica or oxygen or a creep composite. This shouldn't be that surprising. Every modern economy on Earth, even the most insulated, still need imports. But how much our lunar economy can import will depend on two things. How often we can land a load on the lunar surface and how large that load is. A Starship-sized super heavy lift launch vehicle has a generously high-end estimated payload capacity of 200 tons to the lunar surface. If we land one Starship-sized rocket on the moon every single day, 365 days a year, then we could deliver 73,000 tons of stuff a year. That may sound like a lot, but it's not. It's not enough for even a small lunar economy, much less a growing and thriving one. To put it into perspective, that's less than a single medium-sized Panamax bulk carrier from 1980 can carry which is about 75,000 metric tons a year. Wait, no, not in a year, in a single trip, at any given time. But okay, I realize comparing cargo ships to rockets is like comparing apples to atom bombs. However, we're not concerned about energy, but rather logistics here, and 73,000 tons a year is very little. So let me try another comparison that's probably a bit more familiar. A small Walmart receives about 5 trucks a day to remain stocked, which would be about 1,825 trucks a year. And this was actually surprisingly hard to find data on, so tell me in the comments if I'm wrong, but according to several truck drivers, it seems that the typical semi-truck load weight is around 22 metric tons in the US, although it can be much higher. But let's just say 22 tons per truck as a conservative estimate meaning a single Walmart receives about 40,150 tons of goods a year. And yeah, I'm basing this on info garnered from Quora and Reddit posts from truck drivers and Walmart stalkers, but at the end of the day, 7,000 grains of barley weighs 45% as much as a chunk of platinum iridium alloy from 1889, so I am officially proposing the addition of a new unit of measurement to the International Bureau of Weights and Measures the Walmart, which is equal to 40,150 metric tons, or about 619 billion grains of barley. If we land one Starship-sized rocket on the moon every single day, 365 days a year, then we could deliver 1.8 Walmarts of stuff a year. But how realistic is that launch frequency? I mean, can we actually land one Starship-sized rocket on the moon every single day of the year? Well, no. 2023 saw 223 orbital launches, setting a world record for the third year in a row. That average is out to roughly a single launch every one and a half days across all of Earth. Think of all the things that go into a single launch from Earth. The logistics, communication, and supply lines, the timing and tracking and coordinating, all of this done once every 24 hours on Earth by an essential workforce with rare skills and experience who will need vacation and sick days. And now realize that launching a rocket from Earth is not the same as landing a rocket on the lunar surface, and this landing aspect is likely the tighter end of this bottleneck, as you have to take all those things involved in the Earth launch and do them again for landing on the lunar surface plus the extra step of unloading the payload, refueling, and then launching again from the moon back into orbit, all in under 24 hours. This means a round-the-clock workforce with constant supply inputs, not to mention that any time delays and scrubbed launches will cause a traffic jam in the logistic network both on Earth and on the moon, and their solar storms and meteoroid streams which is sort of like a space weather problem of its own. So landing a fat load of any size on the lunar surface once every 24 hours is likely impossible in both the near and mid term. But let's say we can, optimistically, get to the point where we're able to launch a super heavy rocket from Earth every single day of the year. 
these would not be direct trips from the ground to the lunar surface because in reality starship like vehicles need to undergo orbital refueling once reaching low earth orbit to give them enough juice to make it the rest of the way to the moon it's currently estimated that for each trip to the moon anywhere between 5 and 12 fuel launches will have to be performed at a 10 to 1 ratio for every ship sent to the moon 10 fuel launches would need to be performed 11 launches total at a launch rate of one a day, out of 365 launches a year, only 33 would be moon bound, yielding just 6,600 tons, or 16.4% of a Walmart. With eight fuel launches per trip, we net 20.2% of a Walmart, and with just five launches, we net 30.3%. But let's be super optimistic and unrealistic and say the ratio of payload to fuel launches is just 2 to 1. So for each moonbound ship, only two other fuel ships will need to be launched, three launches total. At this unrealistically optimistic ratio, if we launch the largest and most powerful rocket ever built every single day of the year, only 60.6% .6 of a small Walmart would make it to the moon. And then we still have to get people there. So far, we've just assumed people are on the moon, but they have to get there using the same vehicles as the goods they're consuming, sharing from the same pool of 365 launches a year. Using our unrealistic ratio of 2 to 1, out of 365 launches in a year, 244 would be devoted to refueling missions. That leaves us with 121 launches for goods and the humans they're intended to supply. So if we can only get 60% of a Walmart to the moon, we need to know how many people that can support. And we're not talking about survival necessities, food and water. We're talking about a lunar economy with a large tourism base, so amenities. Sure, in the case of tourism, they're there for the experience itself, and people often live in smaller quarters on cruise ships than they would otherwise, but cruise ships still have alcohol and games and stuff. So how many people can a Walmart worth of amenities support? Well, people per Walmart is kind of a bad question because man cannot live off Walmart alone. There are lots of other suppliers in the market, so how could you ever find a reliable metric to base this on? I mean, it's not like there are any places that just have a single Walmart providing for the entire community like some corporate dystopia deserted island Walmart scenario. Oh wait, that's just the Midwest. All across the Midwest and Appalachia, there are small towns with populations between two to 6,000 people whose entire economy and existence is supplied by a single Walmart. Like mining company towns of old, they are Walmart company towns, which kinda confused me. How are these sustainable if they don't produce anything, they just consume Walmart goods in exchange for working at Walmart? Sure, coal company towns monopolized the entire market, but they existed to export coal. They produced something. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Texas, but it was near a large city, and most people commuted to the city for work. But these towns I'm talking about are in the absolute middle of nowhere, way too far to commute. So then how do these towns, which don't commute to a nearby big city and don't really seem to produce anything, no factories or workshops or mines, not even farms in most cases, remain on consumption alone? Now I'm making broad strokes here, as every one of these forgotten places has a unique background and character. But in general, it seems that most of these places were established and grew to their peaks from two things, energy or transportation. Either coal or oil was discovered there at some point a hundred years ago, the mines and wells now long since exhausted, or a railroad or cattle trail stop. And that's pretty much it. But that's the story for tons of abandoned ghost towns too. Why are these still here? How are these places sustainable? Well, the truth is, they aren't. All of them have seen population declines every census for decades. They are on their way to ghost towns. It seems most kids who grow up in these areas move out as quickly as possible. So they are dying, just slowly. Does having a Walmart slow their death spiral? Well, there is only a Walmart there because Walmart felt there was a large enough serviceable market to warrant the upfront investment. So there has to be something other than Walmart bringing money into these towns. 
And with more digging, I found that those who remain and aren't employed by a local Walmart are typically employed in either trucking or the oil industry, the nature of which sees them leaving home for several weeks at a time, and then returning for a few weeks of off time. So they do commute, but instead of heading to a nearby city, they traverse state lines and national borders. Interestingly, this pattern of employment links them to the very industries that originally led to the development of their towns, energy and transportation. These industries have deep historical roots in the community, shaping its identity and economic foundation over generation. Deep roots to the past roots which give these places staying power long past their expiration. Debt, welfare, addiction, they all do their part in keeping people in places like these, but their real staying power, that which has kept these towns on a map with enough population to warrant a Walmart, are their roots to the past. Like old oaks, communities with deep roots may stand for generations, nourished by the past. But while roots can be nourishing, they can also be entangling. While many may leave, emigrating to greener pastures, places of growth, these forsaken places endure because every year some of the youth remain, some who might otherwise have found opportunities and fulfillment elsewhere. Trapped by their families, their memories, their social networks, their comfort, their homes. The weight of history both anchors and restrains. Every generation that remains sustains the community, preserving its traditions and stories, but these are other people's stories, not their own. Futures sacrificed for the sake of the past. Jupiter eating his children. But the truth is, eventually, the day will come when even the strongest oaks must bow. These towns are nothing more than the high water marks of a long forgotten wave the remnants of historical echoes in a void, silently living out their twilight years, quickly approaching oblivion, as one by one, homes are left to rot and the concrete cracks grow. No matter how many once called them home, eventually these forsaken places will fade. Even the oldest trees with the deepest roots are toppled eventually, usually cut down to make way for a new Walmart. This is Rare Earth. Oh wait, no it's not. This is anthrofuturism, what the hell? Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. How many people can a small Walmart worth of amenities serve per year? This is a random smattering of 36 Walmarts in towns across the Midwest and Appalachia that have less than 10k population and aren't located close to a major city. I literally just typed into Google Maps, Walmart, and then zoomed into the middle of nowhere, then clicked search this area, and did that 36 times, and every time I was surprised to find multiple Walmarts. There are a lot more, so this is neither rigorous nor exhaustive, but it gives us a general idea of how many people we can have per Walmart. The lowest population was 1,405, the highest was 8,750, and the average was 5,075. So let's just round down to 5,000. We also have to consider this a high-end estimate because Walmarts typically get their nitrogen oxygen atmospheres for free from the planet they love to pave over, and thus they don't have to maintain an enclosed and pressurized environment with an extensive and material heavy life support system that even with very high efficiencies will always need some level of input, all of which eats into our annual mass allowance. In other words, there's a lot more overhead as some of the Walmart worth of mass will need to go into maintaining the figurative Walmart itself. But anyways, we'll just ignore that and say one Walmart equals 5,000 people. So of our 121 lunar landing launches, how many should be devoted to people and how many to cargo? For instance, if all 121 were devoted to cargo and the humans were left to hitchhike to the moon, then we'd achieve that 60% of a Walmart discussed earlier which would be enough amenities for 3,000 people. But since humans cannot hitchhike to the moon, how many of those 121 launches would it take to deliver 3,000 people? How many people per launch? A Boeing 747 has an internal volume of 876 cubic meters and carries 416 passengers. A 200 ton capable Starship sized rocket would have a 1,000 cubic meter fairing, 14% more than the 747, but would also have to carry more supplies per passenger on a much longer three-day journey to the moon 
than the 747, so we'll call it even and say a single launch to the moon can carry 400 people. So at this point we need to figure out the optimal ratio use of our launch allowance, which is recursive. At 400 people per launch it would take 7.5 launches to deliver 3,000 people to the moon, which would subtract from our 121 launches leaving us with only 113 launches for supplies which would reduce the number of people we can support from 3,000 to 2,814, which would require 7.03 launches, which would leave 114 for supplies, which is enough for 2,839 people, which would take only 7.09 launches. So we could host about 2,800 people continuously. That is the maximum growth bottleneck of lunar development, launching a fully reusable 200 ton capable super heavy lift launch vehicle every single day that unrealistically only needs two orbital refueling launches. When we imagine humanity's future in space, do we imagine 2,800 people or 10,000? 10 million? So that's the problem. The lunar economy's growth will be bottlenecked not by capital investments or even launch costs, but by import logistics, launch frequency, more than anything else. Sure you can establish new launch sites and expand old ones to try and meet demand and loosen FAA standards, but every scrubbed launch due to weather or technicalities will cost time and money. Building out lots of infrastructure, further increasing scale and supply chain logistics for everything from fuel to ground operations. We can also increase the size and payload capacity of the rocket itself, building an even larger rocket than those currently in development. Besides the additional upfront R&D cost, this will also require an increased build out of launch infrastructure, larger facilities for larger rockets, more scale and supplies running through larger and longer supply chains, and a larger workforce. And actually, this sounds great. A massive thriving space industry employing hundreds of thousands of people is a future I want but each of those steps would only marginally increase the percentage of a Walmart delivered per year, and we already took a highly optimistic measure of two fuel launches per trip. Almost all improvements we could do on the ground in the next few decades would just get us to that level. So I know it seems crazy that saying 2,800 people on the moon isn't enough at a time when we haven't had a single person on the moon in over half a century. But unless we want humanity's lunar presence to end up like those Walmart towns in rural America, a flash in the pan, then we'll need to do something drastic to increase our supply lines, and with it our off-world economic staying power. But unfortunately the go-to answer of simply increasing the size of the rocket would introduce a ton of complications for only marginal gain. It's possible to do this for sure, but it doesn't really solve the core issue. The real issue impacting lunar landing frequency is not the size of the rocket, but rather the unavoidable need for orbital refueling of super heavy lift launch vehicles if they're going to make it to the moon. But what if they don't? What if instead of going all the way to the moon, they could rendezvous with another spacecraft in low earth orbit, which could take on their payload and fly it all the way back to the moon? Well, then the Starship-like rocket wouldn't need to be refueled, it could just serve as a ground to low earth orbit shuttle, and the secondary spacecraft would never need to enter into Earth's atmosphere, which means it won't need to be aerodynamic, and if it's just taking on cargo, it can be fully automated, which means no humans, which means no pressurized interior hull. It can be made very simply, just a platform essentially, which means we could make the entire thing out of steel made from lunar regolith using chromium anode electrolysis reactors, which means we can scale this thing up to be extremely large, and it could take on several starship sized payloads in a single trip. And what if we make something like the shipping container of space? On Earth, shipping containers have revolutionized supply chains as they allow loads to be easily transferred from factory to truck to ship in a standardized fashion. So what if we could make something like that, but large enough to take on the 1000 cubic meter volume of a super heavy payload? Maybe we could make it a hexagonal design, which might optimize the trade-off between design simplicity and usable volume. 
And what if, to facilitate this payload transfer between craft, we could build some sort of mechanized scaffolding, essentially an orbital port, just a simple matrix which could move payloads from the Earth ship to the lunar ship. And maybe we can divide this port into three sections, one side for empty containers, the other for full containers, and a loading area. And perhaps we can design it so that once a ship arrives at the orbital port, it won't need to dock. It can simply maneuver into approximate range, open its fairing doors, and the payload could then be captured by the port itself, after which it would be transferred into a waiting container. That container would then be moved into the full area where an incoming freighter would pick it up after dropping off its load of empty containers on the empty side. Then that freighter would return to the moon fully loaded with supplies for a growing and thriving lunar economy. Now you'd think it would be as easy as just landing on the moon, unloading, then launching back and repeating the process, but here our real troubles begin, for in those details there be devils. You don't want to land the freighter too close to the base for safety reasons, but you do want to unload your cargo close to the base for efficiency reasons. You also need to figure out a way to refuel the vehicle, which means you need a fuel depot, but you don't want that fuel depot to be anywhere near your landing spot for explosive reasons. And also you'll want to load your freighter with empty containers to return them to the port for that closed loop container trade. So what, do you land away from the base and use a bunch of gantry cranes for everything? Do you load its cargo onto a rail cart? Do you add wheels to the freighter, adding to its weight? Do you grab it with chopsticks? Well, what if you land the freighter on a landing pad far removed from the base, and that landing pad itself can move the freighter towards the loading, unloading, and refueling area near the base entrance, sort of like the NASA crawler used to move rockets into place. And what if we gave that freighter a little boost in its liftoff by accelerating the landing pad to a few dozen kilometers per hour by simply making the rails longer? But why stop at a few kilometers per hour? Why not go up to a few kilometers per second and use the landing pad itself to also launch space freighters from the lunar surface back into orbit, so the freighters themselves wouldn't need to carry the dead weight of lunar launch hardware and fuel? We could accelerate to orbital escape velocity using electricity, so the landing pad is like a reusable catapult. If we space two rails apart for each leg and run an electric current through the rails, and then the landing pad legs ride upon a conductive armature which connects the circuit, a railgun. Lunar escape velocity is 2.3 kilometers a second, so if we maintain a gradual acceleration of just 1g, that of regular Earth gravity, then our track length would need to be about 300 kilometers and it would take 4 minutes to reach escape velocity. At an acceleration of 2 g's, our rail length is halved to just 150 kilometers and 2 minutes, and at 3 g's it would be just 100 kilometers or 62 miles for only 81 seconds. While 3 G's is perfectly fine for cargo, we may want to use this same system to launch people, and 3 G's can be a lot on the human body, but it can be withstood for short amounts of time. For reference, astronauts on rockets experience it for up to a minute, while fighter pilots experience 6 and even up to 9 G's for a few seconds. However, considering tourism would likely be a major part of our lunar economy, it makes sense not to limit our visitors to only highly trained fighter pilots. Legally, roller coasters can pull 3 G's for no more than 12 seconds, so a passenger version would likely need to be about 300 kilometers, although we could shorten this by having a gradual increase in acceleration and accelerating more towards the end, pulling 3 or even 4 G's in the last few seconds. But initially it makes sense to just use this for cargo per the cargo freighter, and secured cargo can easily accelerate at 4 to 5 G's or more without much of an issue. 5 G's would give us a track length of just 25 kilometers or 15 miles, and would achieve escape velocity in just 48 seconds. But even this is a significant distance. It would be by far the largest thing ever built off-world. However, it can be made of very rudimentary components, 
just simple aluminum rails created from in situ resources using a robotic construction rover fleet, either automated or tele operated from Earth. And it would be worth the investment because by saving the freighter from also having to accelerate itself up to escape velocity, we save a lot more capacity for cargo, which means more resources for people, for more habitats, for more freighters, for orbital port expansion, for more cargo, for more resources. And so what we have just arrived at through a bottoms up, step by step problem solving approach is the creation of a reusable, electric powered system used to drive mass into orbit. A market driven mass driver. But it has issues. The concept of the railgun is over 100 years old, first conceived of in France during World War I, and everyone from the Nazis to the Chinese, the Russians, Indians, and both the US Army and Navy have all poured significant resources into the effort at one time or another, with the Japanese most recently picking up the mantle. Despite all this, no railgun has ever been fired in anger. No designs mass produced. It has never been used in war for the same reason it's considered a bad lunar mass driver design. Ablation. Essentially, rail wear. Gouging and grooving due to the high stresses imparted into the rails from heat and arcing and forces involved in accelerating a projectile up to 2-3 to three kilometers a second within just a few meters. Here's a short, approachable paper summarizing the current state of railgun tech research designs and failure points I'll link in the description, but the main takeaway for us is the technology works, but ablation is the major bottleneck, limiting the system's reusability. The US Navy was able to get off about 400 rounds before a barrel needed to be replaced, and was approaching 1000 rounds before the program was shut down in 2021, but the major costs involved make it impractical as a weapon. But we aren't trying to build a weapon, we are trying to build infrastructure. All previous research has been done in the context of trying to make navy guns with super short track lengths and super high acceleration rates, like tens of thousands of G's of acceleration. Very demanding. Lots of ablation. And it's shocking they even got up to 400 rounds with that. But we aren't trying to fit our railgun into a battleship. We can make our track length very long, and we can make our acceleration rates pretty low. But even with long tracks and low acceleration rates, we'll still have ablation. And this is why railgun designs have largely been considered bad candidates for lunar mass drivers in favor of coil guns which suspend their payload between copper coils, allowing for no surface contact and no structure wear. But the issue with this approach is the payload size would be constrained to the diameter of the coil gun mass driver, which means it won't work well with our freighter design. A design which was logical in being a basic, easy to construct platform, meant to simply move cargo back and forth. The only reason we reached mass driver was as a means to amplify the effectiveness of these freighters, which themselves were the solution to our original market-driven supply problem. On the moon and in space in general, construction costs are the largest costs, which is why we need to put premiums on simplicity, like with the freighter design, and the coil gun mass driver would have much higher construction costs derived from a more complex architecture demanding more resource intensity per cubic meter compared to that of the rail gun, which is basically just simple suspended rails and capacitors. Now sure, with the coil gun, you have rapid reusability, no repair needed, and so while your payloads have to be smaller, you can launch a ton of them in quick succession. But what I think most people miss, probably because the design we're using derives from a coil gun, but it isn't a gun. We're not launching bullets, we're launching spacecraft. You cannot just shoot chunks of the moon out of this thing to a predetermined destination. The loads still need to be powered. There's all kinds of perturbing forces acting on any object at any given time. Consider the sun and moon and earth all interact, which is why some Lagrange points are unstable. Even the varying topology of the nearest planet, different density at say mountain ranges versus plains, has an effect when an object is within the hill radius of that body. So any payload will need to perform station keeping and descent burns to get into a specific altitude or orbital plane. 
So we are talking about launching spacecraft which have to be manufactured and fueled. And so the mass driver really needs to be thought of as a first stage for a rocket more than anything else. And the same principles for why big rockets are better still applies. Scale. So with this context in mind, the question of railgun versus coil gun becomes, do you want to launch 10,000 tons aboard two large spacecraft or 10,000 tons aboard 1,000 little spacecraft? In either case, it makes sense to build those spacecraft on the moon. And it's much easier to build two large spacecraft than 1,000 little ones. As if that wasn't damning enough, the 1,000 spacecraft, basically little rocket pods, have to be recaptured and transported back in a closed loop cycle. Are you just throwing them away? This means they need to be decelerated back to the lunar surface somehow. Under their own power would be very inefficient, but maybe we could use some sort of big platform to capture all of them in orbit and then transport them back to the moon and decelerate them down to the lunar surface. Oh wait, that'd just be the freighter. But instead of transporting cargo in its containers, it would have to transport these little spacecraft, which are too small to be used to import a starship size load unless you want to redesign the entire orbital port to be a much more complex sorting facility to piece apart every incoming payload into a hundred different bundles to fit into these pods, which is just stupid. A potential solution could be to make these little spacecraft much, much bigger. So a single one can launch several Starship payloads worth, and maybe you could land it on a landing pad that moves, and maybe you can move that landing pad really fast on some electrified rails to help with the first stage. And so you can see how a railgun design is optimal. But we still haven't solved that ablation issue. But I'm going to propose a radical solution to that. What if, and hear me out, what if we simply embrace the ablation? What if we simply embrace the fact our rails will be damaged and just repair them between launches? Lunar Regolith contains lots of iron, chromium, and aluminum, and a lot of science fiction books and shows such as Artemis focus on the aluminum aspect, showing lunar bases made out of giant aluminum domes, which I always found funny since to get aluminum, you have to run Regolith through an electrolysis cell. But running Regolith through an electrolysis cell will yield lots of products, not just aluminum. Really, it just removes the oxygen gas and separates the metallic components into stratified layers of molten metals, including aluminum, but also chromium iron, or ferrochrome, typically being more abundant, and molten ferrochrome is a hop and a skip away from steel. Just add carbon. Even if you don't add carbon for steel, Ferrochrome itself is a strong metal, like raw iron, much stronger than aluminum with a higher melting point, which is the more important metric when on the moon given the drastically fluctuating day-night thermal temperatures. This is why I always talk about building nearly everything out of steel, the shelters and ships and rovers. Why bother with aluminum, the balsa wood of metals, when you have the option of using steel? But for the mass driver rails, aluminum actually makes the most sense because aluminum has higher electrical conductivity than iron. And even though we are embracing the ablation, like alcoholism, we don't want to embrace it too much. The lower the resistance, the less ablation occurs. And while copper has the lowest resistance, it's pretty scarce on the moon. So we go with aluminum. And over time, we can reduce this wear by upgrading the rails with cooling systems and composite platings. By cooling down the rails to 50 Kelvin, or negative 220 degrees Celsius, or negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit, we could reduce resistance by an order of magnitude. And this sounds like a lot, but remember, the lunar night already drops down to negative 133 degrees Celsius, or negative 208 degrees Fahrenheit, naturally. But in the near term, just brute forcing it works, because on the moon, resources are ample and power is abundant. So with all of this in mind, one could easily conceive of a lunar construction rover built around an electrolysis reactor that can print rails. Regolith goes in one side, rails come out the other. And a slightly different, modified version of this rover could simply run along the rails between launches, repairing damaged areas. But okay, this is an oversimplification. 
Really, you need a construction rover fleet because the rails themselves should be on a surface that isn't just plopped down onto the moon because the electrostatic dust will interfere with launches. Fortunately, you can lightly melt regolith into what is essentially a rough asphalt paste using orbital mirrors to concentrate sunlight or by creating the evil moon version of a Zamboni, a nuclear powered melting rover. It doesn't matter, whatever is easier. Also, the lunar terrain isn't nice and even. It's rugged and boulder strewn, so you also need basically a lunar bulldozer to clear the path. You know, basic construction stuff. So this series started with a simple problem, a logistics problem, in which we cannot get enough Walmart's worth of stuff to the moon from Earth to support a healthy, thriving, and growing economy. But we solved this problem by breaking up the journey to the moon between specialized vehicles and infrastructure. The first leg of the journey is accomplished by the first vehicle. The super heavy rocket specializes in accelerating a payload from 0 kilometers per second on the ground up through the atmosphere to about 8 kilometers a second in low earth orbit. Then the payload is taken over by another vehicle, the freighter which specializes in accelerating the payload from that low earth orbit 8 kilometers a second up to 10.8 kilometers a second for a translunar trajectory, then decelerates the payload from lunar orbit to 0 kilometers a second relative to the lunar surface. But transferring this payload from the first vehicle to the second is tricky, so we constructed a simple matrix to facilitate this transfer efficiently and safely, the orbital port. Then we built this mass driver to save fuel on launch costs for the freighter because we're greedy capitalists narrowly focused on our piggy profit margins and nothing more. But what if we weren't? What if this freighter mass driver system could be used for so much more than simply increasing imports to the moon? What if a teleporter could be used for so much more than simply advertising chocolate? Don't you realize what you've invented? It's a teleporter! It's the most important invention in the history of the world, and all you think about is chocolate. The little turd is right. If you can make a profit from chocolate and the laws of physics allow, you can reinvest your chocolate profit to develop a teleporter. But once you have a teleporter, using it exclusively to sell more chocolate is idiotic. If you can make ferrochrome by tossing some iron-rich regolith into an electrolysis cell equipped with a special chromium alloy anode that won't be consumed with each use, then you can easily make steel by adding some high-purity carbon into the molten ferrochrome. If you can make steel, you can extrude it into panels and beams, from which you can make things like pressurized habitats where you can host tourists, researchers, students, and sell real estate. And to supply this growing market, you can reinvest your profits to develop containers and freighters, an orbital port, and a mass driver. We've always thought it would be a good idea to create ships on the moon given its proximity to Earth, its low gravity, and lack of atmosphere. However, there was never a clear series of steps towards that end. But now, hopefully, it is clear how the need to import more things to the moon created the demand and context, the right conditions from which a domestic lunar shipbuilding industry will naturally emerge. But once you have a freighter and mass driver, using it exclusively to increase lunar imports is idiotic. If the moon is humanity's gateway to the stars, a lunar mass driver is the key to unlocking that gate. The freighter itself is just a simple platform, a powered carriage built to carry containers. We only called it a freighter because it was carrying freight. But what if you carry a tank full of liquid oxygen? Now is it a tanker? I don't know, I hardly know her, but I do know it wouldn't be hard to make pressurized tanks. You're already making pressurized habitats for people, this is the same thing. We just call it a tank when it holds something other than humans. If it holds fuel, it's a fuel tank. If it holds fish, it's a fish tank. But if it holds humans, it's a lunar habitat. Or a space station. So what do you call it when you strap a human tank onto this freightless freighter and then use it to take people from Leo to Luna the same way we did cargo, cutting out the 8 or so refuel launches per trip. Is this system now a ferry? What if you assemble a bunch of these human tanks together into a big ring in lunar orbit? Now are they prefabricated station modules? 
And if you use a few freighters to move a few of these big boys from lunar to low Earth orbit, carving out significant amounts of habitable, high-value real estate, is it now a cis lunar tug? What if you replace the standard engines on these tugs with very powerful open cycle gas core nuclear engines and then use them to accelerate several stations fully loaded with people and supplies into Earth escape velocity? Well then, I suppose now it'd be a colonial fleet. So if you can do all this, if you can create modular, standardized, scalable, interchangeable designs, then it would be the end of the beginning of humanity's expansion into the rest of the solar system. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, I really appreciate it, and I want to extend a huge thanks to Patreon supporters and channel members who helped make this possible. I've actually set up a Discord for this channel for all Patreon members, so if you're interested in chatting, consider joining. Alright, the next series should be on lunar robotics and automation, so subscribe to stay tuned, and I'll smell you later.